Yeah. Well, we did have it with no cable, but it was a little bit. So I'm just gonna. You can just set it there if you get it open. Gotta pull up. I know. People aim to see you. <laughs> Good morning. Thanks for thanks for joining us for this uh, Issues and Ideas Forum, sponsored by the Mackinac Center uh, and also sponsored by Auto Owners Insurance. Uh, they sponsor all of our events for the year, so we appreciate that. Today's topic is local control or too much control, balancing the rights of citizens and state and local governments. Increasingly, in recent years, local governments have asserted their power, passing occupational licensing requirements, banning the use of plastic bags and scooters, prohibiting short-term rentals, <coughs> restricting ride-sharing, mandating business, offer certain wages and employee benefits, and more. States, and sometimes even the federal government, have responded by preventing local governments from, from pursuing these policy options by preempting local rules and laws with state rules and laws. So this raises a question. What's the right balance between local, state, and federal control? What are the rights of citizens, and should these vary widely based on where one chooses to live? This span panel, featuring a lawmaker, policy expert, and local government advocate, will talk about what's happening here in Michigan, and perhaps a little bit about what's happening across the nation. So we're going to hear the way it's going to work today. We'll get some opening statements from each of the panelists. I'll do a moderated uh, couple of questions. And then we'll take, you have question cards out on your table, so please write down what you want, and then we'll pick them up and, and we'll do some Q&A at the end. Uh, so first up is going to be State Representative James Lauer. He represents the 70th District in the Michigan House. That includes the counties of Montcalm and Gratiot. He's the chair of the House Local Government and Municipal Finance Committee. Uh, Representative Lauer also served a variety of roles at the local in local government. Anthony Mangini is the Deputy Executive Director and Chief Operating Officer of the Michigan Municipal League. He's devoted his career to the service of local government. With over 25 years of experience, Tony's an expert on operational and finance issues relating to municipalities and nonprofits. Chance Weldon is an attorney with the Center for the American Future at the Texas Public Policy Foundation. That's a think tank uh, down in Texas. Um, they've advocated, uh, talked about this issue on local versus state government control a lot, and uh, his foundation has represented a variety of clients uh, fighting government overreach at different levels. Uh, so first we'll hear from uh, Representative Lauer. Great. Can you guys hear me okay? Is Yeah. I'll make sure that's on. As you said, I'm State Representative Jim Lauer representing Montcalm and Gratiot County. Prior to being in the legislature, I was a village manager and also a county commissioner, and I serve as chair of the House Local Government and Municipal Finance Committee. Uh, last term, I served as the chair of the House Local Government Committee. So this year's committee is pretty interesting because it has all the local government issues, but typically we'll look at uh, property tax issues as well. And when I was working with the speaker, uh, that was something that I wanted to fold into the umbrella of my committee work as I have an immense interest in property taxes. It also folds in, we had a separate committee on municipal finance, or excuse me, on uh, unfunded liabilities last session. We folded those uh, issues into my committee as well. So I think I'll start there when we talk about this interaction between state and local government and the federal government. Uh, really, local governments are in a unique position as it comes to unfunded liabilities because due to the state's constitution, any type of pension uh, obligation that a local government would promise to employees is constitutionally protected. So. If the go local government doesn't have the money to pay it, the employees will get that benefit. And that maybe means the state has to come in and bail it out or has to raise taxes in some other, other sector to pay for it. They also have uh, retirement health care costs. Now those are, from a constitutional perspective, less protected, but still these are promises that employees are made and they're expecting the, to get them. So I did a lot of work last term exposing just the sheer amount of unfunded liabilities that local governments have. Because when we talk about debt, Usually we talk about state level debt or we talk about uh, federal government debt, which is completely out of control. <laughs> but what gets overlooked often is local governments and the amount of debt they're holding in the form of uh, retirement promises that they've made to police and fire. And basically what happened is over the years, promises were made at the contract <coughs> negotiating table, signed, and basically therefore ironclad and protected by our state's constitution, which is probably a good thing. 
but then the money wasn't set aside uh, to pay those. And it's a real problem. We're talking about $14 billion, uh, given the most recent estimates in, in promises that just simply haven't been funded. So that's, that's an example of how the local governments really can put the taxpayers of the state of Michigan in aggregate in a, in a, in a bad position. There's other, there's other examples, too. If you look at uh, property taxes, I did a lot of work on local government property tax assessing. And the way the state of Michigan's current system, it's very uh, chopped up. You've got townships that do assessing and cities. And it can be different from city to city or from township to township in what they're doing, how they're assessing, what the metrics are. And how is that a state concern? It's a state concern because actually property tax are the state's, la state's largest revenue source. So you've got income tax, you've got sales tax, a variety of other fees. But when you look at the amount of money that's brought in over property taxes, from a state level and a local level, it is the state's largest tax. So the point that I'm making here is that there is a tremendous interaction and interest from the state level in keeping an eye on and, and maybe managing to some extent what the local governments uh, are doing. I've talked to some really high level big examples, but even on a, on a smaller scale, um, at the end of the day, the most local control is the individual citizen and the individual person who owns private property. And you know whether it be a city or a township or a county, I think as a state lawmaker, we have an interest in making sure people's private property rights are protected. Um, because there's nothing more local than the individual. And I, our government was set up in a lot of ways to fight against tyranny and to fight against uh, government overreach and to fight against uh, people coming in and, and basically trying to run people's lives. Now, I think that's a bad thing if it's done at the federal level. I think it's a bad thing if it's done at the state level. And it's still a bad thing if it's done at the local level. So just because it's local control doesn't make, you know, tyranny okay and doesn't make it right. So when I look at it with uh, the local government committee, if we're considering a preemption bill or we're considering some type of uh, curb on local control, I usually run it through that lens. Is it an interest to the state? Does it, does it affect the state in some way? And does it affect personal freedom in a way that we find offensive? Um, and if it meets one of those two criteria, then, then a lot of times I'll give the bill uh, a hearing and we'll take a look at it and try to do something about it. Thanks. I think I'm next up here. Uh, Tony Mendini with the Michigan Municipal League. And uh, I actually had the opportunity to work a lot on, on some of the issues you talked about related to pension and OPEP and things like that. And there's no question that the local government and state government needs to work together. That's a great example of uh, as locals, we need more authority from the state to actually deal with those. And we saw that we came up a little short um, last session and trying to work through those issues. Um, because we do need to make sure that we're <coughs> fiscally sound, and that's, that's very true. Um, and to get there, we need... <laughs> Ta-da! Um, and, and to accomplish that, we need the help of the state in establishing clear authority uh, to be able to manage those costs more effectively. And that's something we certainly hope to continue to work on. Uh, when you talk about accountability and things like that, though, I think that it's no question the farther removed you get from the local level, the less accountability there is. And this, I, this homogeneous approach to trying to set rules and, and exit things and how we're going to deal with things just doesn't work. Um, you know, we always talk about it in, in many ways. We'll say, you know, if you're, if you're doing that in other uh, issues, we might say that's socialism, right? And that's not something that we get excited about here in, in America. So. Uh, the people that are closest to these issues have a better understanding and a better sense of what the community expectations are and what, the, what needs to be done in those communities. And everyone draws that line in a different place, and I recognize that. So when we talk about individual property rights, we all want those, we all expect those. At the same time, there has to be some reasonable expectations and limits to do that. You wouldn't want to have a junkyard on one side of you and a liquor store on the other side of you if you thought you bought a house in a residential neighborhood. Um, and that's an extreme example, of course, but we're, we're really talking about degrees. We all draw that line in a different place, and someone needs to parse out issues, and we feel very strongly that at the local level, being as close as we are and having a greater uh, level of accountability to our citizens, um, that we think that's where that most logically should occur. Uh, I think when you look around the state and some of the things that have been passed and, and some of the examples that, that the representative cited, um, may not make sense in your community, but it might make sense in theirs. And people, everyone in this room chose to live in a community for a particular set of reasons. And a lot of that has to do with the complexion of that community, how that community is managed, the things that that community values. And those are all things that come into this aspect of local control and why we think that's so important to maintain. Awesome. Well, I guess, I guess I'm up. Um, I'll wait for the microphone to kick on in the middle of me talking like it did with you. Um, 
So uh, thanks, for everybody, for having me. Um, my name is Chance Weldon. I, I work for the Texas Public Policy Foundation. Growing up in, in Houston, I imagined when I came up here to Michigan, it would be like the ice planet Hoth from Star Wars. I was really, I was really pleased to see sunshine and trees and, and all sorts of beautiful things here. Uh, also, I'd like to thank the Mackinac Center for having us. They do a lot of great work in this space. They do a lot of great work on this issue, so I'm really excited to be here at an event with you guys. Um, as they mentioned, I work for the Texas Public Policy Foundation. We're one of the the oldest, largest, and I think most successful free market think tanks in the country. Uh, we have over 100 members uh, on staff. We have offices in Texas and Washington, D.C., and several states around the country. And I work in the litigation center, which means that I sue the government for a living, which is a really sweet gig if you can get it. And thanks for laughing. I can always judge like the room that I'm in based on the response to that description of what I do. Um, but primarily we work in the areas of individual liberty, economic liberty, private property rights, environmental and administrative law. And we represent individuals who have had their constitutional rights violated. Um, we originally began our litigation center by, by suing the federal government. But increasingly what we've seen um, is that cities also get outside of their constitutional box. They also overreach and they also violate people's constitutional rights. And uh, so we've begun suing cities, and we sue cities both, a case I'll talk about in just a minute, in Michigan, in, in Texas, and in other states as well. And uh, the topic today, as you mentioned, is local control versus, versus local liberty. And I think it's an important topic because as conservatives and libertarians and free marketers, we spent a long time uh, fighting back against federal overreach at the state and local level. And we've, we've talked a lot about federalism and local control. And so what we've seen is as we start suing cities or getting the state legislature to claw back uh, city power when cities step outside their box, one of the first questions we always get is, well, what about, what about all this federalism and local control stuff that you guys have been talking about for years? Aren't you guys being hypocrites by trying to rein in cities whenever they overstep their bounds? And my answer to that is always, well, you're using that word, but I don't think it means what you think it means, right? It's not a question of federalism or local control whenever city governments are violating the Constitution. And this question, this question of local control and local liberty, I think it misunderstands both federalism, local control, and even the nature of what cities are. The way that our government was structured, local control was not an end in itself. Federalism was not an end in itself. It was a means to a greater end, and that greater end was individual liberty. And the way that the founders set this up, Madison and others set this up, is each government, they divided power between state, federal, and local governments. And for this to work, each government has to stay in its lane. It has to stay in its box. And when it gets outside of that box, it tends to trample individual rights. Whenever you see a, a city government get involved in a matter of individual liberty or private property rights, um, that's not an exercise of local control. That's lawlessness. That's getting involved in an area where it doesn't have the constitutional authority to be involved. And let me give you just one example of a case that we're working on here in Michigan, which I think is a great example of this. Um, we represent uh, the Percy brothers and Frank Powelson, who are both here, uh, well, one of the Percy brothers, Gary Percy is here today, and Frank Powelson, who are our clients. Uh, and they got involved uh, with a situation with the township of Canton, Michigan. And Canton has a tree ordinance. And under this tree ordinance, it is a crime to remove trees from your own property unless you pay the township up to $450 per tree that you remove, or you replant the trees that you remove with up to three replacement trees of the township's tr choosing. Now, our clients in this case, uh, the Pals Mr. Powelson and the Percy brothers, they uh, got in trouble with the township because they removed trees, their trees, from their own private property without government permission. In the case of Mr. Powelson, uh, it was property maintenance. He had a, a ditch that was, that was getting clogged and flooding his property and, in, in fact, killing trees. And so he had to remove some scrub brush from near this ditch in order to, to clean it out. With the Percy brothers, uh, they removed scrub brush and invasive species from their property in order to, to plant a Christmas tree farm. So they literally cleared brush to plant trees. And in response for improving their property in this way, the township fined the Percy brothers over half a million dollars for removing trees from their own property. And so we sued. This violates the Constitution. It violates the takings clause. It violates the Eighth Amendment. Yet the first question that I got whenever I did a radio interview up here in Michigan was, well, what about local control? 
And the answer is, that's not local control. That's lawlessness. It, things like individual liberty, private property rights, economic liberty, these aren't things that are subject to democratic control. No one should get to vote about how you use your private property. If you're not injuring your neighbors in some way, that's not subject to city council vote. Your neighbor shouldn't have the right to tell you what you can do with a tree on your own private property. So that's the issue that's before us here today. I think that state, the state legislature and the courts have a very vital role in our federalist system and reining in local governments whenever they step outside, outside of their constitutionally mandated box. And uh, I look forward to taking y'all's questions on these, on these issues and talking a little bit more about it. Thanks. All right, thank you. So I'll start us off with a kind of couple of discussion discussion questions. Is my mic on? Good. Um, so some of you guys kind of hit over there's there's obviously extremes on, on both sides of this. So on the one hand, we do violate local control in this country uh, through the, as uh, Chance pointed out, through the Constitution. You couldn't have a local government, you know, banning religious groups from, from set, setting up places of worship or something like that. On the other hand, you know, we don't really want the federal government involved in, you know, naming town streets or something. So can you each kind of talk about how you personally uh, or your, your group draws, draws that line? Who starts? Uh, let's, uh, let's start, we'll just start moving that down that way. Okay. So start with Go ahead, Chance. So I think that, uh, I think the first place that you have to start with these things is the Constitution. You know, the Constitution, whether it's your state constitution or the federal constitution, lays out specific powers that each government has the right to exercise. You know, and the way that, you know, I, it, it's sort of a, I call it the Goldilocks and Three Bears approach to, uh, to governance. The way the founders saw it is the, the federal government is too far away and it's too distant and it's too bureaucratic. And local government, according to Madison, because it's small, it's subject to faction. It's subject to being captured by by interest groups. And the state government's sort of just right. You know, y as long as you cabinet it in with, with federal constitutional protections, it's going to sort of respond to both of those concerns. So basically, if it's a matter of, you know, naming streets or potholes or, or basic land use regulations, that's something that local government should be in charge of. And um, if it's something with interstate commerce or, you know, foreign invaders, that's something the federal government should be involved in or one of the enumerated powers in Article One, Section 8. But for pretty much everything else, it's going to be the state government or, mo more importantly, it's going to be individuals. You know, it's who decides. And in most cases in our system, the individual property owner, the inv individual business owner, they're the ones who get to make those decisions. So, so I'd put it there. Yeah, you with my committee, a lot of the times we, we get these bills to look at, and I try to take them on a case-by-case -case basis. You know, for example, the, uh, the tree ordinance uh, legislation came to my committee last session, and uh, we did give it a hearing, and I personally supported it. Um, it we didn't end up having the votes for it, though. I, I think a lot of it came down to timing, and it, it became pretty much a hotbed issue. But one thing that I've tried to focus on as chair of the committee and as state representative is looking, and given my background in local government, there's a lot of normalizing that I think we can do for the state where you have a lot of local governments with just varying degrees of regulation on whether it's local licensing. Uh, you know, I passed a package of bills to, to normalize that for the state. I think a lot of that work clearly needs to be done because when our state has grown over time, in the old days, the local governments probably had a little bit more uh, space to operate in, say, a local licensing or, or an issue like that because you didn't have the technology we have today, we didn't have vehicles, we didn't have the way, uh, ability to communicate that we have now. So it's just recognizing that. Most businesses have to go through a cycle of updating, they have to go through a cycle of uh, survival in order to be relevant in the marketplace. But you know, a local government or state government or even a federal government doesn't have as much pressure uh, to do that because at the end of the day it still has the authority to collect the taxes and uh, spend them on whatever the council votes on or whatever the state legislature or federal government. So I, I've tried to balance that and try to be a voice for updating and normalizing our local governments because there isn't very much pressure on doing that. It's actually one of the reasons I wanted to run for state representative when I look at you know local townships in my community or cities that are doing things on paper you know or with a typewriter and making it inconvenient for citizens Be why because there's not any pressure on them to to get better and then if you look at uh, the example of the local licensing that really did affect the state if I'm a plumber in you know Greenville Michigan and I want to be a plumber in Detroit or Grand Rapids you know the license that I have from the state of Michigan 
should apply all throughout the state of Michigan. I shouldn't have to go and pay an additional fee or go through an addi additional licensing process just because I moved. That, that's wrong, and most of my colleagues agreed that was wrong, and we passed those bills through and got them signed into law. So I think those are examples of my philosophy on it. I just think when it comes to commerce, and trade and things like that, and, and certainly personal property rights and, and personal responsibility. Those are things I like to, to step into the fray on when it comes to preempting local control if we need to do that. You know, when we talk, see, I'm the only one who gets the mic shut off. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> <laughs> Conspiracy? I don't know. Uh, you know, when we think about this a lot, again, I come back to some of my opening comments. Um, one size fits all approach rarely, if ever, works. and. Uh, when we've seen that try to happen at the state level or the federal level for that matter, it usually is problematic. We represent cities, everything from Detroit to the smallest little you know, cities and villages in the UP. They're uniquely different places. They have uniquely different issues and often that requires the, lo the local leaders there to consider regulations that, that make sense in that community. And things that might make sense in a small town in the UP would never work in Detroit and vice versa and they need to have that ability to do that. Uh, part of the problem I think we run into here is even within this room um, where I think generally people would be uh, leaning in a particular direction, uh, you'd all have a different place we draw that line. What we would think is acceptable and what we would think is okay uh, next door to your house or, or down the street or in a business in, in your community might be different than the person next to you. And that's what local leaders are elected to do. We elect them to represent us and to try to figure out what makes sense in our community. Uh, you know, you talk about things like uh, the plastic bag ban thing. Some of us might find that to be silly. Others might think, you know what, I'm a really staunch environmentalist and I think that's very important, that I see a longer term, bigger goal here, and I'm supportive of my community if that's something that they thought was important here and, and that there's enough support in the community. And really, when you think about representative government, that's what it is. We're electing folks that, in theory, represent the community at, at, at large, and the decisions they make should be reflective of that. If not, you elect somebody else and, and the, the things change. And we see that at every level of government. Um, and you see the tide shift in both directions. So when it comes to these individual things in these communities, it's different. You know, I, I'm sure at some point we're gonna talk about short-term uh, property rentals. If I have a, a house on the lake in a resort community, I pretty much should have an expectation that the guy next to me might be planning to rent their house out. And if I'm in a different part of the town or in a different community where that's just not part of the norm, I might have a different expectation. And I'm not sure either one of those things are wrong. And only the local governments in those situations, I think, are in the position to try to understand and make sense of that stuff. So uh, Rep, Rep Lauer talked <coughs> uh, a little bit about the pension retiree debt uh, situation. Um, and I think there has been, that was one issue where there was disagreement and, and there, there was some consensus on some parts of, of that bill package, which is essentially made it so that um, local governments have to report what that debt is and, and kind of if it, if it gets below a certain level to come up with a solution to that and they work with the state on that. That kind of triggered in my mind um, some of these situations we see in Michigan, especially uh, for that and for uh, the school system, where a lot of the funding comes through the state for the school system in particular but you do have these local school boards that make some, uh, you make some decisions. And then in the pension retiree debt situation, like we saw in Detroit, the state was ultimately on the hook uh, for a lot of that debt, which required um, funding come from the state level. So can you talk specifically about that, um, where the state does have a responsibility because it's constitutional protection on pensions or is responsible for funding for the schools, and yet what, what is the responsibility? We can, we can start, uh, maybe Rep Lauer, you can take okay, that one first. Sure. I think this is a good example of us working really well with uh, MML, you know, Township Association and Counties, because on that particular bill package, we were on the same page for the most part with what we we're trying to do. And even I mentioned my property tax assessing reform. That was something actually the local government uh, groups supported. And in both cases, there was something we were trying to do. And when you looked around the state at local governments, they all were using different assumptions for calculating the debt even. Like they, there wasn't even any consistency when it came to what's the mortality table? How long are people going to live? What uh, assumed rate of return are we gonna get on the investments? 
um, and a variety of other factors that, that either increase or decrease the liability. So it's all over the map. You're talking about literally thousands and thousands of different pension and retiree health care plans that had various levels of, of funding and various levels of management. Some were very well managed, some were you know kind of in the middle, and then there were others that were very poorly managed. But in, in every case, if something were to go wrong with it, as I mentioned in my opening remarks, the state's on the hook for it. So that's something we had actually partnered with mm -hmm. the local governments on to try to try to find a solution. And it got very political. I, ironically, in that case, we weren't really fighting with our friends in the local government. We were fighting more with the uh, union special interest groups because they didn't want to see uh, they didn't want to see the reform on it because the flexibility that that's allowed under current law would have gone away in a lot of ways. One thing we were proposing is something as simple as if you're going to make a promise for a pension at the local level, then you have to fund what that costs both today and in the long run and make those payments where currently under law there, there isn't really a strong requirement um, to do that. So one thing that we did get done with the bill package was trying to at least use consistent assumptions throughout the state. So if I'm comparing the city of Greenville to the city of Alma in my district, when I'm looking at the pension plans, I have some comprehension of an apples to apples comparison. Whereas prior to the legislation, there's no, there's no way to really even compare them. If Alma's saying, we're going to get 10% assumed rate of return, and the people that retire, they're only going to live to be 75 years old, it's going to look pretty healthy, you know, considering the level of funding. You want to invest in Alma. Like yeah. 10% rate of return. Right. But that's what you were looking at. And then you have Greenville, who maybe is using a 7% assumed rate of return and is assuming people are going to live to 85. Looks on paper like they're doing a less good job of funding their plan when they're being more realistic. So it was a very complicated uh, bill package that we'd worked on with the governor and the Senate um, and certainly in the House and just didn't get as far as we wanted to go. One thing we did do, though, is using those uniform assumptions and getting a lot of awareness on the issue. There's a lot of pressure from the public to get it solved because I don't think anyone in this room or certainly in the community I represent wants a police officer or a firefighter to retire and then have the pension plan go bankrupt. Or in the case of the retiree health care, that's not even constitutionally protected. So what you saw in Detroit is it, it went through and cleared a massive amount, literally billions of dollars um, in, in promises that were made to retirees. So. I, I kind of got painted as wanting to take away benefits um, from retirees, and I think even MML did in some ways. Uh, it wasn't true at all. We wanted to make sure, look, if you're going to promise that locally, at least put the money away to make good on your promises and don't rely on the state to bail you out uh, down the road like what we saw with DPS, which was the public schools, and also with the city of Detroit um, in the bankruptcy. So unfortunately, it got pretty political when it came to the union groups and making it about trying to pit you know, us against people who were working or were retired from a fire department or from a police officer and look at, you know, evil Rep Lauer, he's trying to take away these benefits and MML just wants to slash these costs so they can, you know, spend the money elsewhere. Those were kind of the arguments that were made when it wasn't true at all. What we were trying to do was make sure that, you know, if we were making these promises locally, we're using uniform assumptions and the money's actually going to be there. Yeah, I'd just like to echo a lot of what Rep Lauer just said. Um, I think that this is a great example of where uh, the state being a partner in, in helping us solve this problem is something that is beyond maybe a particular individual government. And we did spend many, many months working on this. Uh, we came up a little short, though. And the reality is, you know what, we do want to slash those costs to spend money in other ways because w that's a, a tremendous uh, portion of local budgets right now, far bigger than it should be, as you know. We spend a lot of time with those numbers. And we're sa some communities might be spending 20, 30, 40 percent of their general fund budgets to fund these legacy costs. It's an unsustainable amount of money. So n no one advocated, though, elimination of those benefits. What we really talked about was modernizing of those benefits, saying if you're going to get 2019 health care, you should have a 2019 health care design. Uh, that's something that, at the local level, we can't do without clearer and more expressed authority. And that was one of the things we set out to do that we, we came up short on. That's something that I'd hope we can continue to, continue to work on going forward because I think that's a great example of where telling the locals fix it all on your own, it will fail, and as we've seen uh, in what happened in Detroit, that's the worst case scenario because you lose the benefit completely, the state has a, a huge intervention, it's politically difficult to deal with, and, and so I think this is a great example of working together more closely to, to deal with those things makes a lot of sense. Great. Um, so for Rep Lauer and, and Chance uh, in particular, but Anthony, you can certainly jump in on this. One of the one of the things we hear about here in Michigan is uh, more so than any other state, local governments have been less reliant on state funding. So we, we have 
uh, money that comes through the sales tax system that's constitutionally obligated to go to local governments. Then we had extra money out of the budget, and that, that amount has uh, declined quite a bit over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and so what about the argument that, hey, the state's not picking up their end of the deal. Why, are they, why is the state getting more involved in telling us what we can or can't do when they're actually providing less funding for us to do it overall? Chance, you want to take that first and then Rep. Lauer, just that, that idea. Yeah, you know, I'll start with that. I, you know, <laughs> I think unfunded mandates are going to be a problem. I don't know the details of, of how funding works in Michigan, of course, but I do think that there's a fundamental difference between the state telling a, a local government that it has to do something and telling a local government that it can't do something. Because when the, when the government, when the state comes in and says, hey, local government, you can't do X or you can't raise taxes this way or you can't en engage in this sort of land use regulation, what they're doing in that in that situation is they're protecting Michigander. Is it Michiganders? Is that how yes. you guys say it here? Oh, they're it's controversial, but yeah. just Could be, be careful. I don't want to. I don't want to step in any sort of political firestorm here over the term that I use. But um, but they're protecting the people's rights in those situations. So if the state wants to come in and say local governments, you can't pass these sorts of laws, that's one thing. But if they're putting mandates on local governments um, and then not paying for them and then not pr providing the funding for them, I think that it's a, that's a far more complicated question. So if you look back over the decade from basically 2000 to 2010, the economy for the, or even in, in 2014, the economy for the state of Michigan was in a huge downturn. You know, our, our recession basically started earlier than, than the country, went deeper, and consequently took longer to recover from. So during that time, prior to me being a state rep, I was on staff. Um, the budget had $2 billion, $3 billion deficit, so of course we had to balance it. And in the local communities, not only was the revenue sharing reduced as a result of that, but their property tax values were going down, and rightfully so. You know, if you're if you're being laid off and your and your house is worth less, the property taxes uh, should go down with that. Now, one of the arguments that our, our friends at MML like to talk about is that they they don't they don't come back up as quickly as they'd like to see. Now that we're you know in the full throes of a recovery and we're under four percent unemployment, my my view on that's a little bit different because I think like once you have a recovery, I think it makes sense to allow people with their personal income and their family uh, enjoy more of those benefits before the government. Uh, you know, coming in with, with higher taxes. So that was the impetus behind um, the Headley Amendment. I mean, it wasn't the only argument, but the Headley Amendment really is what protects uh, property tax values from going back up dramatically. They, can, they are allowed to fall dramatically during a recession, and they, they creep up slowly. From my perspective, as somebody who's very conservative when it comes to property taxes, I think that's a good thing. It is hard for the communities, though, when they have these legacy costs, when they have a lot of buildings and uh, programming that they're trying to provide locally. I understand that, but at the same time, if I had to t pick between the two, raising taxes on people in a recession in order to fund the local governments or coming in and basically taking a lot of their newfound wealth that they've gotten after the recovery and putting into the local governments, I'd rather the local governments waited a little longer. I know that's not going to be a popular opinion with my friends in, on the city council in my district or the townships, but that's just where I'm at on it realistically. I think that the public um, needs a little bit longer to recover. I mean, I, I look at my mom and dad, for example. Uh, he was laid off during the recession, my father was, and what that did to their finances, that takes a really, really long time to get over. You know, when you, when you go through that level of, um, I guess you'd say economic trauma, it takes a long time to recover. So. I'm fine with it taking longer for the property taxes to recover at the local level. Yeah. If, if I didn't respond, I'm pretty sure I'd be fired, so <laughs> uh, I will comment. Uh, really what the problem we have is, is we never recover. Um, the way we've constructed the interaction between Proposal A and, and Headley, is, as the representative said, property values can fall without limit, um, and in some places they lost 50 percent or more of taxable value. Once you get to those new levels, you're now limited to inflation or 5%. So what we really have is a disconnect from the, from the economy. And any revenue system that we're going to use to fund government or anything for that matter uh, has to have some ability to track with the economy. If, you, if you're in a business, any other business, times are tough, you're going to tighten your belts, you're going to cut costs, you're going to do a lot of different things. And then in a, in a prosperous time, you're going to grow, you're going to invest in your R&D, you're going to do a lot of things. Local government get, doesn't have that recovery right now with the way we've built this model. Um, we always knew the math worked that way, but we never really saw it manifest itself like we did in, in the Great Recession. So when we saw these incredible drops now, um, two biggest sources of revenue in local government are property taxes and revenue sharing. Um, both of those are down dramatically. 
Uh, we've diverted over $8.6 billion, if you go all the way back to, to 2002, uh, away from local services to fund state government. Uh, sadly, I've been around long enough to remember days of pre-proposal A and how we sold that. And part of proposal A did a lot of different things, as, as you may know. One of those was, was cities used to get a lot of different pools of money from the state. And one of the things that was uh, presented to local government at the time was, we're going to get away of all these other things, income tax and intangibles tax, and you'll get a larger piece of the sales tax because it's more stable. And that's very true because even during the economy that fluctuated wildly, sales tax was a very stable source of income. What didn't prove true is that rather than the state figure out how to, to absorb that, they just took it away from local government. And so the state was able to balance their books on the backs of local government. So we think um, that shouldn't have happened, obviously. Um, we also think it's really to our broader long-term detriment. Um, if you think about the things that attract people to a community, attract people to a state, that help incent economic growth, it's having great places. And if you look at the places that are booming economically, have highest values, highest growth, um, where businesses choose to locate, uh, those are all places that are created by investment and strong communities. And we've disinvested in that for the last 15 years plus. So uh, we strongly think that we should consider reprioritizing um, where we spend the dollars that we have, not necessarily advocating for tax increases as much as what do you do with the dollars you have? Where do you get the most bang for the buck? And we think there's a good argument to be made that to really incent strong economic activity, if we could have stronger communities, uh, we would all benefit from that. Um, so reminder, you've got cards on your table. Go ahead and fill them out. I'm gonna, I'll am gonna i do two more questions and then we'll, we'll take some stuff from the audience. Um, so Anthony, for you, um, Rep. Lauer made that point on uh, one of the ways he looks at this is on some of those issues that are that are commercial or deals with trade or commerce or moving around. Um, you know, the example we talked about in the local licensing of, of somebody that works in one town and lives in one town wants to work in another. Does it make sense to, to kind of have that done at the state level? Or I'm also thinking kind of the example of another one we fought over in Michigan a couple years ago um, on the Uber issue. Um, should we just have a state license for some of these trades and allow people to work everywhere? Or is it important really for the local government to have another role in that? How, how do you guys look at that? Yeah, you know, I mean, again, I think that's one of those one size doesn't fit all. Uh, if, if you're a community with lots of activity or having issues with trades, it might make, there might be a reason why you think that's an important issue. In other communities, it, it's not. So I don't think that that's something that you can just say it should always be this way or always be that way. And I think that's where we often fall into a trap um, of trying to paint everything with the same brush. And, and there's things where we would all agree. Everyone would agree you wouldn't want to have a, an 18-wheeler driving down a residential street. Well, that's a local ordinance that would regulate how, how we're doing those types of things. And we would all say, yeah, that's silly. And it's where we draw those lines. And it's hard to anticipate every situation that you're going to encounter uh, in a local community as to whether or not they should or shouldn't have uh, the authority to do certain things. Um, so Chance, I had, I had a question for you. Um, this isn't just a local uh, Michigan issue. It's, it's happening all over the country. Can you talk a little bit about um, what, what you guys have seen? I know you've litigated on behalf of people and, and are, are, are seeing this in other places. Is this a new thing? Is there an increasing way local governments are looking at some of these issues? Is it the same old fight? Can you, can you discuss that? Well, I think it, in one sense it's not new. Of course, Madison pointed out back in the seven, you know, the 1790s that, that local government was subject to trample on individual rights, particularly even back then in areas of economic liberty and private property rights. Those were the issues that he feared most with regard to local governments. But what we've seen increasingly, at least in Texas and in other places around the country, is that you do have this idea in local government that they're not a government almost. They think that they're a homeowners association, right? That they can nitpick and whether it's what you know the, the height of your bushes or what you do in, inside your house whether it's whether or not you rent your house for less than 30 days or whether or not you uh, what time you go to bed and in particular in Austin they regulated bedtimes for short-term rentals which was crazy um, <laughs> but um, I can't even do that in my house yeah and and so that this idea that, that somehow because it's local and that it's close to the people that that makes tyranny okay that if we all get together and we discuss it at a city council meeting and then they, then we vote for it that it's okay to say that, you know, guess what, you can't work for Uber, or you can't work this many hours in a week, or you can't let someone stay at your house for less than 30 days. And those are, those are issues that have always been best decided and fundamentally must be decided as a matter of fundamental natural rights by individuals and not by government and not by democratic institutions. 
And, and somehow along the lines, we've lost that, particularly at the local level, with the, these local city councils deciding that they're a neighborhood association that just happens to have the, the power to throw you in jail. So, um, so we've, seen that, that we've, we've seen that increasingly in, in Texas with, with cities, and we've seen it also around. So, so yeah, to answer your question, yeah, it is, it is getting worse, but we're fighting. Uh, these are great questions, so maybe I should have uh, cut my moderating down, or that was a way of people telling me that. So we have some good ones to get through here. Uh, so first, do you see the, just the pure number of municipalities as a, as a hindrance to high-quality local governments? Or I'd add a tweak to that, too. Does that make this more of an issue here in Michigan? We've got hundreds of cities, hundreds of townships, and then, of, of course, 80-plus uh, counties. Uh, Rep. Lauer, why don't you take that, that one first? Sure, I, I can do that. You know, when you look at it, I think the, the issues that Anthony brought up regarding the revenue sharing are exacerbated with the amount of um, the amount the pie is, is broken up. When you look at the amount of local governments we have, you could provide more funding for placemaking in, in, in larger cities and things like that if, there, if it wasn't being uh, allocated across so many entities. It's just like a business. If you have a lot, of, if you have overhead and a bunch, across a bunch of different departments it's, and it's inefficient, uh, that can cause problems. And like I mentioned in my earlier remarks, there's not really a lot of pressure on government to try to reduce overhead costs. And a lot of uh, government is overhead costs because it is people, it's police, it's it's fire and it's it's things like that. So I think that it is logical to examine our whole structure of local government, whether it even be schools and townships and cities and, and ask, is this the best way, most efficient way to do it? The problem with that is, Politically, it's tough. You know, people like their local township. They like their their city council. They like their having their own school with their own mascot. You know, playing on Friday nights for football or basketball or whatever it happens to be. So, politically, it happens to be a tough issue. But I would tend to agree that you could probably do it more efficient, uh, more efficiently if you had um, more shared services, which is something that Governor Snyder really put an emphasis on. He tried to encourage uh, through revenue sharing, uh, incentive programs, more sharing of services. When I was village manager for Edmore, for example, we closed our police department and partnered with the county and uh, bought a deputy from them and paid for uh, the contractual obligation to have a deputy there 40 hours a week. It was much cheaper and much more efficient for the community because we weren't paying for a building, we weren't paying maintenance on a car to have our own car, or phones, radios, just the, the cost we were able to go down from 120000 to um, you know, somewhere around 80000 I want to I want to say. So we saved about $40,000 a year and I would argue we had a better quality uh, law enforcement as well because they, they have access to the training under the sheriff and so forth. It was such a small town that it really w uh, didn't make sense for us to have our own standalone department. So I think there's a lot of examples where local governments are doing that on their own and it's something I'd like to see more of. Yeah, you know, uh, the, the shared services is something that uh, I know Governor Snyder put an emphasis on, but it's something that was occurring long before he got into office uh, in the, the very first meeting we had with them we presented thousands of examples of that and having worked in local government you you know that people do try to do that i think one of the things that gets lost um and i'm going to be a little schizophrenic here because i do agree when you just take money and treat everyone the same way and you know solve for x maybe that's just money you're giving somewhere that they don't even know what they're going to do with it and it could have been better spent somewhere else having said that i go back to what i said earlier everyone here uh is living in a community for a particular set of reasons and some of that might have to do with service levels. It, maybe it has to do with efficiencies. I doubt it. Um, but I think you have to have that flexibility to think about, I live in this community, and, and I, I'll t give you a good example. I, I actually lived in Canton Township for a time and worked there in Plymouth Townships immediately to our north. If I blindfolded you and sat you in either one of those communities, uh, you wouldn't know which, and I, I'm blindfolded, you wouldn't know which one you were in. But Plymouth's philosophy at that time was, they were going to provide a little bit less services, but they were going to be a little bit cheaper in terms of the, the tax they charged. And Cairns was the exact opposite. They wanted to have a much broader offering of services. And people went north or south of Joy Road for that reason. <coughs> and that was a perfectly logical and appropriate thing to do. I think you've got to have that flexibility to make those types of choices and allow communities to, to be distinct and different um, to, to, again, serve the community that, that has chosen to, to be a part of it. So Mr. Weldon said, what you do with your own property should be no one's business but your own. What about these scenarios? It's not exactly what I said, <laughs> <laughs> but close. So, something like that. Uh, what about these scenarios where personal use of property does affect neighboring properties? The short-term rental issue, 
is an example. Uh, does that change the calculus and how much flow flow control to allow? So uh, to answer that question directly, you don't have a right to use your property in ways that actually injures your neighbors. And it's, you know, since time immemorial, local government has the right to enforce nuisance laws with short-term rentals. They can enforce noise ordinances. They can, you know, enforce, you know, parking and trash ordinances. If you're, you know, people are urinating in your bushes, you know what, the city should probably come out and do something about that. Um, and, and that's certainly within the local police power to do that, always has been. That's not part of your property right to create a nuisance. What they don't have the authority to do is come in and say, hey, everybody be in bed by 10 p.m. or if you want to rent for 31 days, that's okay, but if you want to rent for 29 days, it's not. Or they don't have the right to say, hey, look, we really like looking at your tree, so we're gonna fine you half a million dollars if you cut it down. Those aren't things that are subject to neighbor control because those aren't things that injure your neighbors. Those aren't real nuisances. So I think that's where you draw the line. If there's some property use or something going on on a property that's actually harming a neighbor, Look, cities have always had the authority to, to regulate police power problems, enforce your noise, your noise ordinance. Um, but if not, then they need to leave those decisions to, uh, to individuals. Great. Go ahead, anything oh, to add? If you want us to chime in sure. on that. Sure, anything, not. if you got anything to add, go I for it. I have a couple things to add on that. You know, there, there's some examples um, that I can think of just off the top of my head that have to do with legislation that even has come through my committee or even when I was city manager. So I'll, I'll start with the local level one. We had a gentleman who wanted, who was building a new house in, in town, and it was the first new house that had been built in probably a decade, you know, just because of the recession. So he was building the house with an attached garage, and he also wanted a detached uh, garage in the back. And he had to get a uh, zoning variance for that for a variety of reasons. And the way that works is you have a public hearing on it. And I thought we should approve it, and I think the council did too, and we did ultimately. But the hearing was pretty interesting because the folks that turned out um, their arguments were, well, we like, we like looking through the back of that property and we can see deer running around back there. And, uh, you know, it just, th that garage back there is going to obstruct my view into the forest. You know, I don't think that's fair. I don't think that we should, you know, place government regulations on people because the neighbors happen to enjoy the view. I mean, that person had a right to build the garage and we, we let them build the garage. So that's a, that's a local example. Another, in the, in the same vein, we had a, a bill that passed and ultimately was vetoed, but we're working on again this, this session that has to do with uh, foster care facilities. Now the neighbors of this proposed foster care facility came in and said that, um, you know, these kids are bad kids, you know, they're going to be running around in the neighborhood, run amok, you know, I, I don't want them there. You know, basically the whole premise was is that foster kids are by definition bad kids. Therefore, we shouldn't have this foster care facility. That's, that's just categorically wrong in my opinion, but the other element was there was more to it than that. They also enjoyed letting their horses loose and letting them run around on the property, and they wouldn't be able to do that if there was a building there. So, I mean, I think this is the flip side of the coin of, like, your neighbor's property, you know, what they're doing on it impacting you. Well, maybe it impacts you, but maybe you shouldn't be freely using your neighbor's field to, you know, let your horses go or, or just categorically deem, you know, foster kids to be bad kids, and they're going to cause all sorts of, quote, unquote, ruckus, you know, in the community. So. That's just an element of it that I try to take into account when we're looking at this, too. Question here. So if a local government fails to address a major issue, does that give the state government the license to intervene? Or conversely, uh, if it's, or vice versa, if a, if a state government fails to address a major issue, does that give the local government a license to intervene? Kind of broad, uh, major, I, is, I guess. Yes or no? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, well, I mean, again, I, it's, it's hard to know without knowing what the issue they're, they're, they're speaking to, right? I mean, because something could be a major issue at the local level that the state would have no interest in or no reason to, to give thought to. And I think that's a large degree what we're talking about here today. Um, you need to have the ability to address these issues and, and do that. And short period property rounds, in my mind, is one of those things. Um, you know, when you buy a home, and I'm thinking, picturing my house right now as I sit in it, uh, it just so happens the house next to me actually is rented out, and it's rented to a family, and they live there, and they're interacting with the community, and they're part of the fabric of that community, and it has in no way changed the expectations of anyone that lives in my community and, and how they use their property or what we all thought when we moved in there. If I had a new family there every week, um, I, I don't think that'd be the case, and I think that does have an impact on how everyone else's property is impacted. It would make me uneasy to have my children playing in the backyard and running around freely. You know, you get to know your neighbors, you get to do stuff. That's a real thing. 
I wouldn't have that same expectation. I very regularly will go, you know, rent a condo for the week and go down there. And 90% of those places are, are units that are rented out and the 10% that aren't pretty well should have understood that you're in a resort community and, and you should have an expectation um, that this is how this property will be utilized. I think that's totally reasonable for local government to t look at that and say, we need to protect the fabric of this community, keeping our community safe in a broader context. And it's very hard to, to regulate uh, through these other means because you have a revolving door of people rolling through town. I, I think, and I, I just like to speak to that, I think that if you don't want certain things going on, then you have the ability to live in a deed restricted neighborhood that you voluntarily agree to. And at the end of the day, government isn't a neighborhood association and it's not a homeowners association and it's not something voluntary. It's the decision when government gets involved in something, it's the ability, it's the power to come with a gun and say, if you're not going to do this, then I'm going to throw you in a box. And that's what these regulations are. That's what a tree ordinance is. That's what an STR regulation is. It's a group of people saying that we think that you shouldn't do this with your property. And if you do it, we can punish you for it. We can send men with guns to punish it, punish you for it. And so at the end of the day, whenever I buy private property under traditional common law principles, going back to the Magna Carta, I think that I can have the authority to lease that property out for 20 days, 30 days, and unless there's something in my deed that, it, of course, if I have a deed that says that I can't do that, then I can't. But for people to come along after the fact and come to a city council meeting and say, I'm going to take that property right away from you because I would prefer my neighborhood to look different, it's, it's the same ugly sort of thing that we, used to see, that we used to see in the South, that people get to decide what their neighborhood wants to look like, and we get to use guns to do it. And so I'm probably a little more fired up about this issue than I should be because I live in Austin and I deal with this craziness all the time. <laughs> On every, on, every, on every sort of issue. But I do think that there's a fundamental issue here, which what does it mean to own private property? What does it mean to purchase something and own it? Does it mean that your neighbors get to decide what you do with it? Or does it mean that you get to decide what you do with it so long as you don't hurt your neighbors? And that's the fundamental question. Yeah, I think there's some good examples that we talked about earlier in terms of OPEB, and, uh, which is the unfunded health care liabilities, and also pensions being too big of an issue for the local governments to challenge in, or to, excuse me, to tackle individually on their own, and that's something that we, we agreed on. I don't want to get lost in this discussion about local control, but the fact that there are some good innovative things happening at the local level that do make sense to have happen there. I'll give just a couple of examples, but when I was city manager, there was this really blighted property that had been abandoned for about 20 years. It ended up going through a, a property tax uh, foreclosure process, and the county offered it to the to the village, um, so we bought it cheap, you know, for like a dollar, because no, nobody wanted it. Nobody wanted it because of the liability, because of all the contamination and and the blight on it. So uh, and it, it was bought prior to me coming in. But when we took it over, we cleaned it all up. We got rid of a lot of the the scrub trees, ironically, and uh, and things like that that made it a terrible. You, uh, you would have had to pay a penalty. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Uh, that made it a, made it really well, didn't get the permit. made it really an ugly property and something that was a huge drag on the downtown. It looked terrible. You know, as you came into town, it was awful and it was dragging down the property values of all the neighbors. So we were able to solve that. There's a lot of interesting things going on in my district with homelessness and Alma that they're tackling uh, through their local community churches and kind of some local problems that are being solved in a way that's really innovative and kind of exciting. So there are examples where the local governments can do a good job, you know, solving kind of a niche issue like that that I don't really think that a, a statewide policy makes sense on. Great. All right. Last, uh, last question, kind of a comment here, but give you a chance to comment and maybe, maybe close up your thoughts with. Uh, so somebody writes in that local control is a tool, not a principle. And like all tools, it can be used well or it can be used poorly. Can you comment on that, maybe tie it to your uh, philosophy for kind of a, a closing? Chance, you want to start? Man, I think that nailed it really well. Um, Local control is it's absolutely a, a tool. And we've, we've, we support local control. We've supported local governance and state governance for years, particularly on the right. Um, but it's always been a means to an end. And that end has to be individual liberty. That, that end has to be individual rights and innovation and things like that, that that make people's lives better. The freer people are and the more close to the people the governance is, their lives are going to be better. They're going to be able to innovate. They're going to be able to create jobs. They're going to be able to make people more prosperous. And at, at the end of the day, that's what matters more than anything else. It's about recognizing the inherent dignity and worth of individuals. So yeah, local control is a great tool 
to fight tyranny and to, to create those things. But it, you have to remember it's a tool. And the end, at the end of the day, is individual liberty and individual prosperity. So I think that's a great comment. You know, I would tend to agree with most of that. And as, as Tony knows with MML, when they come in, I don't, I don't treat local control as like a trump card. Like you can't throw that down on the table for me and be like, that's it, local control, you know? Because as the examples we've gone through, there's a lot of examples when that ends up being a really bad thing and it's used in a way that I believe takes away people's personal private property rights. But it also has its good elements too that we've talked about. So I would tend to agree with what Chase said and whoever wrote that, what they wrote, and I think it's a good, uh, good way of putting it. I don't think it's the be all end all, but I also don't think it's a bad thing either. I think there's pros and cons with it. Yeah, and, and I agree. I, I like the way that that, that question was characterized because I do think it is a tool. And and again, I come back to where, where I open this, which is you've got a government closest to the people, and every place is a unique place with unique expectations. And managing and, and making sure that those individual rights aren't in conflict with one another, um, that's a local issue. That's something that has to be dealt with by the local government, um, I think they're best suited to deal with those issues um, on a daily basis. Great, thank you. Please uh, help me thank our, our panel. Thank you for coming. Um, feel free to, to grab uh, some drinks on your way out or some publications if you're interested. I'm sure these guys will stand around for a, a minute or two. Um, we have two. We have a couple upcoming events, uh, which will be in Lansing. One is on uh, the price of auto insurance. Maybe you've heard about that issue. Um, and another on uh, whether government can put a price on life. So if you're interested in these events, uh, make sure you sign up for the mailing list to hear about it. Um, and we look forward to seeing you soon.